one minute call. before, so maybe we'll start one or two minutes after. Give people some time to catch their breath from the last one. Okay, it's 2.01, so maybe we will start, Todd. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, let me share my screen. And move. Oops, oops. Too many. The uh, Zoom bar doesn't, it's not in the right place. Um, all right, so hi everybody. Thanks for joining us for the very last session of uh, Force 23. Uh, I'm Nettie Legassi. I work at NISO where I'm the Associate Executive Director and I'm very proud to be part of the last presentation here. Um, and I hope everyone's had a great online conference. Um, for this panel, I'm serving as moderator and also the initial presenter. Um, as you can see, I'm here with my fellow, fellow panelists, David Meller, uh, Helen, Helena Cousine, Sarah Lippincott, um, and we're going to present our perspectives on how we might facilitate an open research ecosystem through the adoption of standards and best practices. Um, you may know NISO. Uh, NISO is a standards organization, and that's our reason for existence. So, of course, I'm a proponent of standards. Um, but I think in the scholarly commu communication area of work, standards and cooperation are part of a way of life for all of us, really knit into our fabric. Um, and there's so many examples of how we work together to create standard processes, tools, and frameworks. So this slide um, is a slide that Todd Carpenter created some time ago, and it always seems to get a positive reaction. So I couldn't resist including it once again, maybe you've seen it before, um, but we really do believe that setting standards and best practices enables cooperation across different communities and provides connections that might not always already be there, um, not unlike grease and gears in a mechanical setting. Um, in many communities, a standard can be used to ensure that something is built for uh, that is built for a user in that community will be as effective as possible as soon as possible. Uh, it provides a transparent description of a process that a user or a consumer can understand, perhaps build into a acquisition kind of process. Um, it ultimately standards build and foster trust between suppliers of material and end users. And the, we believe the benefits of this trust cannot be underestimated or understated in uh, my opinion, having standards exist as a stepping stone can support further innovation, sharing, and growth. Community agreement in particular uh, areas frees up time that can be applied pushing forward in more specialized areas. And I think everyone knows that time is a precious resource, particularly over the last few years where uh, everyone has been stretched in so many different directions. There is just not enough time. Um, to do all the things that we want to do. And I think standards really provide a, a great way of moving forward. So just a few words about NISO and what NISO does. Um, NISO creates, publishes, and maintains standards and best practices. As I said, that's our reason for being. Um, we foster adoption of existing standards, not only our own. We uh, are proponent of standards that are created by all kinds of communities. Um, we educate the community on technology related issues and incubate thought leadership activities to advance technology. 
Um, this slide lists just a few of the concepts that go into our working group practices. Um, I won't describe them. Um, we have our NISO procedures for that. Um, that's a long kind of boring document, but we work really hard to be as open as possible and it's baked into all of our processes. Um, I wanted to take just a few minutes to talk about a few of our current projects that I think contribute to the open ecosystem that all of us at FORCE want to foster. So first off, um, we have a relatively new project. Uh, it started last year called CREC, um, and this is an acronym. It stands for Communication of Retractions, uh, Removals and Expressions of Concern. Um, and as you probably know, uh, retracted research is published work that is withdrawn, removed, or otherwise invalidated from the record. And it is relatively rare, but um, somehow when it's inadvertent and somehow when it's inadvertently propagated within the scholarly record uh, through citations it has an outsized impact in a negative sense um, so what this project is intended to help is to uh, solve the problem of this propagation of misinformation by clearly identifying the parties that are involved in the retraction process um, describe their responsibilities actions notifications and the metadata that's necessary to communicate the retracted research so that um, all parties can take steps to minimize the um, further propagation of this. Uh, CREC is an output of both the recent Sloan, founded, a Sloan Foundation funded project, reducing the inadvertent spread of retracted science, that's RISERS uh, based at UIUC, and uh, NISO Plus 2021, our conference last year. And um, it will be consistent with existing guidelines such as those published by COPE and uh, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors um, and the Council of Science Editors. Um, we haven't yet published this work. This is will be a NISO recommended practice. The working group is in progress now, and there are two subgroups, one that's detailing publisher workflow and the other detailing aggregator or um, consumer workflows. And in between the full working group meets to gauge progress and discuss general issues, they're working now to start to pull together a draft. And we hope that that draft will be available for public comment um, by sometime this summer. So this is something to look out for. Um, we hope that all of you will be able to provide your input to make this uh, much stronger recommended practice by the time it is published. Uh, the next project that I would like to talk about is called Credit. You may have heard of this. It's been around for a little while, even before it came to NISO. Uh, Credit stands for the Contributor Roles Taxonomy, and it came to NISO a few years ago and was approved by our um, uh, accrediting agency, ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, last year. Um, Credit is a high-level taxonomy. It's 14 roles that are used to represent roles typically paid by contributors to schol scientific scholarly output. So it does weigh heavily in the scientific area right now. Um, we are hoping to broaden it to other areas in the near future. Um, it's a simple and effective way to help promote greater visibility and recognition for all of the different kinds of contributions that contributors make to scholarly research output. Um, and they describe different roles. So for example, conceptualization, data curation, methodology, et cetera, um, describing uh, how different parties have um, made contributions to a particular output. Um, there are different uh, adopters of credit, including scholarly publishers and system integrators, and we are looking for more adopters. Um, and working towards uh, supporting implementation of the taxonomy across uh, the scholarly research ecosystem as broadly as possible. This work is managed by a NISO standing committee, which uh, works on its uh, determining potential directions and plans for how we might support it. And we are forming a soon a credit community of interest, which will provide further input to the standing committee. Um, the last uh, project that I would like to highlight today is also a relatively new one. It is not yet a NISO standard, though it is in the final stages of this, and uh, it's called the peer review terminology. Um, as you know, uh, peer review is a process that is assesses the validity, quality, and often the originality of articles uh, that are published. And its purpose is to maintain integrity in science by filtering out in, invalid or poor quality articles and ensure that research outcomes are exposed to relevant audiences through publication in uh, 
specific journals. So it's a cr really crucial pr uh, process and a pillar of the scientific process method. Um, this started, uh, this work started at STM several years ago, and uh, the impetus is to ensure greatest tr greater transparency and openness in the process um, and harmonize and better communicate definitions of discrete elements of peer review so that members of the community, if they're authors, reviewers, editors, or readers, can easily recognize how they may more productively participate in this process and imp overall improve the process for everyone. Um, so the STM group created the definitions and then uh, these came to NISO where a NISO working group managed further publisher trials of the definitions and finalized it for publication as an anti-NISO standard. Um, we've just now finished approval by NISO voting members and we're working on responding to comments and making final editorial changes before we submit it to ANSI in the next few weeks. I hope that this will be published sometime next month. And I just want to remind you, standards do the heavy lifting and uh, hopefully it moves you faster on your path wherever you're going. Um, I'm very excited to hear about the work that my colleagues on the panel will discuss, and I'm going to pass the baton over to David Meller to introduce himself and talk about his topic, the top guidelines. Thank you, Nandi. Um, do you want to take a question now that came into the chat, or oh, I didn't see. Yeah, thanks. I didn't see the um, I didn't see the chat, so maybe that's a that's fine. It's a, just one question. Um, will publishers enforce credit in contribution disclosure? Um, I think that is up to the individual publisher. There isn't anything about enforcement on the publisher side in the standard itself. Um, it's just adoption of the term. So how it's implemented in many ways is um, on the part. And I think publishers who have adopted it, some have published have adopted it in particular journals and not others. So um, it's, uh, it's something that is uh, coming. Awesome, thank you. Yep. And um, let me know, I think you can see my presentation. Yes. And I'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, my name is David Meller from the Center for Open Science. I'm the director of policy here, working to uh, with publishers, funders, and other uh, policymakers on implementing obviously best practices and, and standards in, um, in, in open science towards the goal, of course, as the session title, facilitating open research ecosystem. Um, I'll post a link to these slides in the chat um, afterwards, and um, information about us is included on our website. And I'd like to just give a very brief overview of who we are as an organization and how we do what we do. So the Center for Open Science, uh, we are um, uh, uh, in our 10 year anniversary this year, and we are a mission and culture change organization with the mission to increase transparency, credibility, and reproducibility of empirical research. And we do that through uh, a, a process of trying to make open research practices possible through building infrastructure that enables data sharing, collaborate, collaboration, study registration, and replication. Uh, we work to make it as easy as possible through UI and UX improvements, help to make it as normalized as possible so that others can see what their peers are doing uh, and recognize that these aren't uh, crazy outliers who, who are taking these new steps, but it's becoming a bigger and bigger uh, normative practice within, within the academic research community. Uh, and, and we finalize our theory of change with uh, steps to make open science practices uh, more rewarding for individual researchers and eventually make it required. And I'll be talking about those uh, last two st steps on our uh, theory of change there through the framework of the transparency and openness, openness promotion guidelines. The top guidelines were published in 2015 and they cover um, eight specific uh, practices that can occur throughout the research life cycle. And they are, you know, can be, a, and they're written in the format of author guidelines for journals and journal editors to um, implement, you know, recommended steps and instructions for uh, what can and should occur, you know, prior to submission or prior or, or as a condition of publication. 
each of those steps can be implemented in one of three levels of increasing um, rigor and str stringency. Uh, the best example is the standard on data transparency. So a level one of the top guidelines requires disclosure of whether or not the open practice occurred. So in this case, it would be in the format of a data availability statement. Level two of the top guidelines is, is a mandate, is a requirement for transparency. So uh, you know, deposition of uh, uh, relevant data sets in a persistent location and with the exceptions permitted for ethical and legal constraints. And then level three is a real reach goal for um, for verification that the open practice was done and done well. Uh, and so in this case with data uh, and usually with analytic code, it would be a step of computational reproducibility. And there are several dozen journals that do take that, that final step there. So as I mentioned, top guidelines were uh, published about seven or eight years ago now. Um, and during that time period, we had been working on a signatory campaign to show adoption and, and philosophical appreciation of the uh, steps covered in the top guidelines. Uh, we haven't been doing that for a few years, but um, have been focusing more on the degree to which these standards have been implemented across the scholarly ecosystem. Um, and so now we use that uh, on a database called Top Factor, an evaluation of journal policies on the degree to which they align with the framework uh, uh, provided by the top guidelines. Um, so far, we have 2,400 journals included in that database, and we're adding more every day. So the Top Factor is a, a searchable database of journals. Uh, as I mentioned, um, each of which have been evaluated, uh, each of the policies of each um, having been evaluated on the degree to which they require data disclosure, require disclosure of material sharing, the degree to which they discourage or encourage practices such as replication studies, um, and, and the use of other items like uh, use of reporting guidelines that are often curated by the equator network. Any of the uh, journals included in the top factor database uh, have a description of what their policies state um, and how that aligns with the levels uh, covered in the top guidelines um, and uh, a link out to the rubric under which these criteria were evaluated and the author guidelines um, on which they were on which they were evaluated. So I mentioned uh, earlier in our theory of change that we you know, in, in, uh, try to make open science practices uh, possible, easy, normal, rewarded, and eventually required. Um, that same philosophy, that same strategy is applicable across policymakers as well as you know, everybody else in the world. Um, and so we, we do use top factor as a method for sharing and comparing uh, journal policies among peer journals. Um, so this has been out since the beginning of about 2020, um, and this is a, a sample of 317 journals that were included early in the data set, a comparison of their evaluated policies um, back in 2020 to what they are now in 2023. Um, and we've seen some shifts of uh, more use of data availability statements, more encouragements for submitting um, replication studies and more use of a publishing format known as registered reports where, where peer review takes place before the, the results are, are known by the reviewers or authors. Uh, 65 policies from that uh, list had uh, uh, upped, had, had added open science policies during that time and um, seven of them oddly did, did not or, or lowered them and the, and the rest had no change. Um, the transparency and openness promotion guidelines are starting to undergo a, a process for updating and consideration for what standards are um, are less relevant now than they were or that should be included um, that weren't included in the original publication so all of these will be open and i'll i'll uh, make a note of that at the end of this uh, starting next month for a public comment period for updating and revision uh, but a couple of the things that are under consideration or that have been suggested over the past several years is making sure that transparency across the complete research life cycle is indicated. Uh, so uh, more recognition that um, results reporting in an open way, whether it's 
preprints, open access publishing, or through structured reporting formats that that's available, um, and making sure that protocols are also uh, covered under the top guidelines. We're thinking of making more dis, uh, di uh, discrete parts of the top guidelines as opposed to sequential levels. Uh, so these steps, the disclosure and archive of the open science practice and a verification of it can in some ways be done independently of each other. So giving credit and recognition and language uh, that uh, shows each of those independently as opposed to sequentially is something that's under consideration. We're working on ways to make a distinction between open science practices that could occur in any research project as distinct from open scholarship programs that really require a journal or a university or a funder to, um, to, to implement. So things like registered reports are journal specific or funder specific if they, um, if, if they make it part of their funding mechanism. Uh, replication studies uh, for consideration for again publishing or funding um, aren't necessarily under the discretion of any given research research project. Um, and peer review is a newly proposed standard to be included. Um, and of course, uh, that can bring credibility and, and trust to the um, underlying results, but it's not under the uh, individual researchers control, of course. Uh, the other panelists, which we'll be getting to, thankfully, I'm very excited to hear more about um, uh, the, the ways that um, top guidelines can and should be improved. The go fair principles, of course, focus on uh, sort of recommendations for how data sharing, uh, you know, needs to be done, needs to be done well, and so uh, more specific directions from uh, from top pointing to the lessons learned from the fair initiative, um, and, and making sure that um, the exceptions and the best practices that uh, are relevant. Uh, for indigenous communities or for communities where complete data sharing is, um, is neither just nor fair are lessons that the top guidelines are trying to incorporate in the recommended practices. And finally, there are movements to make additional applications of top, not just for uh, journals, those will still be included, of course, but more specific language for funders, evidence clearinghouses, and academic institutions and universities for including this in, uh, you know, in, for including these criteria in uh, hiring and promotion criteria. So as I mentioned, the public comment period will be starting in, uh, I think, late May 2023, so stay tuned for that, and I will stop talking now and I'll put a link to these slides uh, in the chat right now also. Thank you. Um, and our next speaker is uh, Helena. Yeah, thanks Nati. Nati, oh. we're having some audio issues with your mic. Oh, is this better? Yeah, that's better. Sorry, I just moved it to be closer to my mouth. So, but I'm going to stop talking now because it's uh, Helena's time. So, thanks. So, let me share my screen. Yeah, so thank you uh, for the invitation and uh, for the opportunity to uh, be part of this, uh, this panel session. Uh, I'm Helena Kusain. I'm a Data Science Director of Community Engagement, and I was asked to talk about FAIR in this session. Uh, obviously, a really important topic, but also a really big topic. Uh, and I'm sure you all know a lot about it. And uh, there are a lot of things that um, all of us could contribute. Um, so I decided to focus uh, on enabling FAIR through connected persistent identifiers and metadata. Um, that's obviously also what Datasite uh, works on. Uh, I think most of you will probably be familiar with Datasite, but we are a global not-for-profit membership organization. Um, we work with organizations in 50 countries, um, at the moment over 2,800 repositories, uh, and we provide DOIs for research outputs and resources. Our vision is to connect research to identify knowledge. And how we do that is uh, through DOIs and metadata for a wide range of research outputs. 
Um, as the name data site implies, this really started from uh, data sets um, and the recognition that these were first class research outputs and that they that persistent identifiers and the discoverability and citability of data sets were important. Um, but as, uh, as David also said in his talk, I think there's now really recognition that all the different outputs are really valuable and should be made available. Um, and so, yeah, DOIs can be registered for data sets and collections, workflow software images, models, and uh, to uh, output types that we're also really focusing on right now are samples uh, together with the IGSN community and, and uh, data management plans. Um, but basically all the different types of outputs that you can find in a repository, also gray literature, dissertations, reports, uh, you can uh, assign DOIs to and register metadata for. Um, well, I think you're all familiar with the, with the FAIR principles, uh, also, uh, of course, something that was uh, partly developed in the context of, of FORCE. Um, but their guiding principles um, focused on making data and other outputs findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, one thing I thought was probably interesting to uh, point out in the context of this session uh, is that FAIR is not a standard. <laughs> um, I mean, I know we're not just talking about standards here, but um, I know this is a bit more standards focused. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, I, I found a clarifying article that explained fair, the fair guiding principles are sometimes incorrectly referred to as a standard, but actually they're not. Uh, they're guiding principles and they allow for many different approaches to rendering data and services findable, accessible, interoperable uh, to serve the ultimate goal of reuse. Um, and so, yeah, I think I very much agree um, that they allow for many different approaches. And so the approach that I'm suggesting today is through persistent identifiers and metadata. And I think my interpretation is really that in a way, uh, FAIR can be seen as an implementation guideline. And David also uh, briefly referred to that already, that it's kind of about the how. Um, so on my screen, you see a research organization and there are lots of different outputs coming out of that organization. Um, and well, I suppose traditionally these would often just sit on someone's laptop or on a hard drive and not be, really be part of the research ecosystem. And then there were data sharing policies that said, oh, actually, no, it shouldn't just sit on your laptop. You should be making it available. But then I think we also all agree that if you just put it on a website somewhere and uh, no one knows it's there and there's no description of what it is, there's really not a lot of value in making something available. And so for me, I think that is really what FAIR is about. When you're making data or other outputs available, what is the right way of doing that? So that in the end it is reusable and it does become part of the research ecosystem. Um, so yeah, I'm going to argue that PITs are really an integral part of the FAIR puzzle. Um, and then not just that identifier, that string of characters that you can attach to an output, but really mainly in a way the accompanying metadata that's registered when a persistent identifier is registered. And looking at data site DOIs as an example, um, looking at the findable facet, um, DOIs are unique and persistent, centrally managed and governed, um, looking at accessibility, uh, DOIs use HTTPS protocol, resolve to a landing page, uh, and all the metadata is stored in reliable community-owned infrastructure. Um, when it comes to interoperability, um, it's, it's the scheme is provided in several formats and there are links available to other identifiers, which I'll come back to later. Um, and the, the metadata properties have been chosen for accurate and consistent identification uh, for citation and retrieval purposes. So obviously there are more steps that you can take, but by assigning a persistent identifier with rich metadata, you're already uh, making a very good start in making data and outputs available in the right way. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, and David also mentioned, 
uh, really important to have a, a broad interpretation and not just think about, okay, here's one data set or one output, and it's important to have a bit of metadata, but actually this connection into the research ecosystem is very important. Um, this is uh, an image of the PIT optimized research cycle uh, developed by more brains. I thought I would borrow this here because it sort of outlines that um, they're not just persistent identifiers for the different types of research outputs, but also for researchers, for research organizations, for projects. Uh, and those are all very important entities to have information on. And if we then go back to the data site metadata schema, within the metadata, you can actually establish, establish all these connections. So when registering a DOI for an output, in the DOI metadata, uh, you can include name identifier information to connect to researchers and an affiliation identifier to connect to a research organization and funding reference to uh, connect to funding. And then, well, I don't know if unlimited is true. <laughs> I think I, there is someone from DataSite on the call who probably knows that answer, but in theory, unlimited related identifiers to make a connection between the data set and all the other research outputs that are related to it, all the articles that are based on it. Um, and then almost as a bit of a side note, maybe some of you were also in the fair workflows panel on Tuesday, where we also talked a lot about metadata and where we also shared that something we're looking at now is to see if maybe there is value in connecting to domain specific metadata because um, the data site metadata scheme, and I think this is maybe also true for some other persistent identifiers, um, is intentionally generic and not um, focused on specific domains. And so in this fair workflows project funded by um, the Templeton World Charity Foundation and in collaboration with a research group and CEDAR, we're looking at um, connecting to domain specific metadata and seeing how that uh, contributes to the fairness of the outputs and the reusability of the outputs. But yeah, going back to the importance of connecting different entities, different types of persistent identifiers uh, through the metadata, what we're doing is um, creating a graph that we call the PIT graph, the persistent identifier graph to ensure we can see all those connections between data sets, papers, funders, people, organizations, software. Um, this was actually developed in the context of um, an EOSC project and also currently in the FAIR core for EOSC project. We're working on further expanding that. Uh, but I think a key thing to keep in mind is this can be enriched by doing metadata well. So every time a persistent identifier is registered, the richer the metadata, the more we can enrich the graph and the more information we have. And that then enables us to, to visualize all the different outputs that are associated with researchers, with organizations, with projects, and, um, and shows how uh, outputs are being made available in a fair way. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. And uh, I guess I hand it back to Nettie. Thank you, Elena. Um, any questions for uh, Helena in the chat? Not at this time, um, but anyone should feel welcome to put any question at any time or comment or observation. Share, please. Um, so uh, next up, we have uh, Sarah, who's going to talk about the forest framework. So Sarah, thank you. Thanks, Nettie. Um, can you all see my, my slides? Yes. All right, great, thanks. Um, so uh, many of you may know me from my role in Dryad, or if you attended my lightning talk earlier this week, um, uh, you may know me as head of community engagement at Dryad, um, but I'm also involved in library publishing. I've been involved with the library publishing community for many years. Um, and most recently, I've been involved with a project called the Next Generation Library Publishing Project. And one of the primary outputs of that project was the forest framework, a set of best practices intended to help scholarly communication organizations and communities to demonstrate, evaluate, and ultimately improve their alignment with core values. My co-author Catherine Skinner and I developed forest as a tool for bringing about system change in scholarly communication. We wanted to, to uh, figure out how we can build a resilient, ethical, trusted network of knowledge producers 
and upend the the extractive models of of publishing that um, that are so common in scholarly communication. The forest framework asserts scholarly communication as an inherently values driven activity and encourages participants pertinently to the conference theme to consider how their local practices have a global impact and connect them uh, in the ways in which they are um, accountable and interconnected with other stakeholders in the system. Uh, at like FAIR, as Helena mentioned, forest is not a standard per se. Uh, we call it a framework, but like a, it has a lot in common with standards. Like a standard, it helps to build trust between participants in a system, establish common expectations and terminology uh, that help communities function together. Um, and uh, Catherine Skinner and I believe that an equitable, efficient, and sustainable commons, uh, knowledge commons, requires robust governance mechanisms defined by and carried out by stakeholders. So in the knowledge commons of model, uh, model of scholarly communication, information is the inalienable resource of a regenerative system in which researchers continually build upon the work of others and return their own contributions. Supporting and maintaining a commons like the one we're describing requires um, accountability mechanisms for all participants. It requires shared, uh, an established set of shared values and principles um, and, and common practices. There's no shortage of manifestos and statements of values out there. Um, as a precursor to developing forest, Catherine and uh, uh, our colleague, Sarah Whipperman, distilled down the values and principles that they found in over a hundred uh, of, of this kind of um, of statement, think of things like POSI, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, as an example of one of the, the ones that, that our team analyzed. Um, and uh, to look at for, we looked for commonalities and ex between them and explored the question, have they been effective in bringing about change? So while values and principles provide a scaffold for community governance of the knowledge commons, um, uh, to drive change, we think we also need to tie these, these values and principles to specific and concrete practices that demonstrate alignment and progress. Before I talk specifically about how forest bridges that gap, I want to talk about how forest and other frameworks like it can bring about change um, in, in more general terms. Frameworks shift power dynamics, um, and, and I think this applies to, to standards as well, or, or uh, guiding principles, or whatever you want to call this type of, um, of, of document. Um, frameworks shift power dynamics because they provide strength in numbers around aspirational values. Uh, they, they show that um, there is community consensus around these aspirational values and put some weight behind them. Frameworks facilitate collaboration um, because they help to establish common expectations and terminology, and collaborations thrive when partners are, can set those expectations up front. Frameworks are tools of engagement, not checklists, so we expect organizations to return iteratively to the forest framework um, to measure their progress, to reevaluate themselves and their, their, or their partners. Um, we don't see this as a one-time activity or a, a checkbox to, um, to, to, be, to be done. Uh, and finally, frameworks encourage informed decisions. When choosing where to invest resources, values-based frameworks provide tools to, uh, for, to help organizations make and justify values-based decisions. Um, so to, uh, to mention a few kind of potential use cases for forest, a, a, pub, a library publisher might approach, uh, might use the forest framework to help it make decisions about what tools and platforms it uses in its publishing work, which vendors it, it contracts with. An editor might use it to advocate for specific improvements in the alignment of a publisher's actions or, or workflows with academic values and principles. Um, and a service provider or vendor might use it to conduct a self-assessment of its int internal practices and policies as a show of, of good faith to its, its customers. Um, FOREST uh, stands for financial and organizational resilience, openness, responsible governance, 
equity, accessibility, anti and anti-oppression, sharing of knowledge, and transparency. Those are the top level values um, that, uh, that we assert uh, as, as kind of inherently connected to scholarly communications activities. And for each of those values, we propose a hierarchical set of principles, indicators, and evidence. These elements work together to enable scholarly communication stakeholders to first consider what values and principles are most relevant and meaningful to the communities with whom they work, and then to consider how best to manifest those values and principles in their daily work. Um, so for example, uh, the, um, for the value equity, accessibility, and anti-oppression, uh, Forrest uh, has four principles. Each principle has a set of indicators. Um, so for example, the principle attract, welcome, and retain stakeholders with diverse lived experiences um, has an indicator offer or require regular EDAI uh, and anti-oppression training for all employees and leadership, and then a, a suggested item of evidence, so documentation of that such training being offered during the previous 12 months. So as you can see, this couples these kind of uh, these big picture aspirational values with the concrete day-to-day -day activities and, um, and, and proof documentation of uh, that those activities are being carried out. Um, it's important to note also that Forrest points to some, many of the other standards that have been mentioned today where appropriate. So we mentioned FAIR, um, we would mention something like TOPS uh, when, you know, when um, referring to, um, to best practices. Um, finally, I just wanted to mention that we did conduct a pilot implementation of the Forrest framework. Our pilot participants came from scholarly communications organizations, uh, both for-profit and non-profit. We asked them to evaluate themselves against one of the values uh, in the forest framework and run through a series of, of what we call reflective practice questions uh, with their team. Our pilot participants um, overwhelmingly reported that these sessions prompted deeper conversations than they typically make time for within their team and resulted in concrete and specific plans for action, including creating and revising policies and procedures and changing the way they communicate or present themselves to stakeholders. Um, a core challenge for implementation of of frameworks and standards is balancing the need for uh, not to reinforce existing power dynamics that privilege better resourced or more mature organizations. Um, frameworks have to be flexible enough not to disadvantage communities purely based on their resourcing or stage of maturity. On the other hand, they need to be robust enough to hold communities accountable and prevent indiv individual players from gaming the system. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a tension that I'd be curious to discuss more with all of you. Um, in the meantime, thank you for your attention, and you can download the forest framework uh, at the at the link on the slide, and I'll also put that in the chat. Uh, back to you, Nettie. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, so I would like to invite Helena and David back to uh, turn on their cameras. Thank you so much. Um, uh, curious if anyone's got questions for any of us uh, in the chat. Yes, thank you all so much. I I really enjoyed putting together this panel and working with you to um, figure out how we might communicate. So thank you all. Um, any questions from the audience uh, or observations about any of the uh, presentations that spark any thoughts? So I've got a few that I can throw out, but. So something that we had discussed as a panel, uh, a few things. Um, what are ways to incentivize adoption of these practices or standards or guidelines or recommended practices? Um, once something is out there, you can uh, promote it. Um, what are some other mechanisms for helping people to understand the benefits of these works? Any ideas or any ideas from the audience too? Um, what might help you to find uh, a way to adopt one practice or another?
So I'll, I'll throw one idea out there that we thought a lot about with the forest framework, um, which, which may seem, seem simple, but, um, but a, a lot of thought went into packaging the forest framework as a, as a toolkit um, so that, uh, that organizations can actually work through the, the framework, um, uh, that it has a, a roadmap and it has instructions for how to engage with it. Um, so it's, it makes it a little less opaque, um, a little easier for organizations to actually get started and envision how, um, how they can make it, uh, how they can ap apply it to their setting. Yeah, I might say even it's, um... I, I think it's designed well in, in your presentation. It's really, um, I have to say, Sarah, it's quite attractive. So that is a invitation um, in, a, in a good way. David. Uh, a little bit of a cliche in the open science community, but I think it applies particularly well to the, the, the use of persistent identifiers, um, like Helena described, is the, um, fact that they become extremely useful to yourself a year or two or three years from now when you're trying to go back and see you know, what you know what was connected to that um, paper you were using, where the data were, where the code was, or or, or et cetera. So um, you're know, sharing case examples of um, people finding either organizations or individuals, you know, finding utility in that in the practice. Uh, for themselves, not just for the kind of community or, or other benefits that are um, espoused by all of them. And um, kind of related to that are just the, the, the practice of, of making these more, more visible. So sort of sharing what you do, what works well for you um, is kind of a step that anybody can take to sort of demonstrate that, you know, these, these PIDs or, or applying the force framework to your organization and the benefits that you saw from it or whatever it happens to be. Um, that, that's kind of the some of the practices that we see in sort of community awareness and normalizing some of these, these new things. Um, I had a question for Helena. Um, if you, you, you made a, a good joke about, um, you know, <laughs> theoretically it could be an infinite number of PIDs um, per, per project, which would be you know, fun. Um, but I just, yeah, that, that did spark a little bit of a, 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 you know, a chaotic scene in my head of, um, you know, yeah, just a, a unnavigable uh, mess that you can't get through. And, and I, I was wondering about work that you're aware of or what's going on with like a two-way period. So like if you, you know, persistently identify the data set associated with the paper, um, getting from the paper back or getting from the data set back to the paper is also necessary. So I'm just wondering um, how, um, what, what are the best practices or what's on, on the horizon um, in that area, if you know of anything? Yeah, so I think my colleague Kelly, who's also on the line, is currently checking whether what I said was true. <laughs> and it's actually <laughs> possible, <laughs> possible to enter limited related identifiers. I mean, I. Right now, I would say we're definitely encouraging sort of this bi-directional linking. So not just, let's say, to take the example of an article and a data set, not for not, so that it's not just the information coming from repositories and the data metadata, but also coming from the publishers and the article metadata. Um, and I mean, potentially that does lead to sort of an issue with the duplication, but I think right now we're still at a stage where we just want all the information we can get. Um, I think there was a hand up actually already Yeah, before. so uh, yeah. Uh, Sun Young, it, uh, I see you have a comment in the chat, but I, your hand is also raised. So if you want to say something, please um, <laughs> unmute and, and talk to us. Yes. Um... Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, I mean, these are a lot of useful information and to disseminate this to down to research level is a daunting task because of me as a librarian, I have a hard time keeping up with all this uh, wonderful information, what's coming out, what we're working on and stuff. So I try to do my best. <clears throat> we have a website. So specific for data management sharing, we, we built it to educate people on the new NIH data management sharing plan requirement. But um, we keep adding and expanding. This kind of information can be shared through that. But not everybody do that, right? So we, you know, I mean, we write 
blogs. The recent one was a PID, so it was a perfect. <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to have a workshop next week about the types of PIDs. And I mentioned, you know, protocols.io, you can get DOI for protocols, which I highly recommend. And, and that's one way to connect all your research outputs through the ORCID ID and, you know, protocols and publication and all that stuff. But we are part of library. So um, we don't reach out to everybody within our institution, you know, Wash U. But there's a separate office, like the Office of Sponsored Research, your Office of Vice Chancellor for Research, which has a broader reach to the researchers. And they're not always on top of this kind of information, unfortunately. And um, so I don't know how we can reach out to them and um, kind of disseminate this information fast to the researchers so they know what's going on. Maybe you know they can participate more. I mean, NISO standard is great. Um, I didn't know the credit was became a part of NISO standard. That's good to know. Uh, you know, that's another thing I encourage. And then retraction is another great initiative. I would love to see that. I would like to see publishers put on like a big label on top if this was retracted so that we can easily identify and stuff because otherwise it'll get cited and you know people don't necessarily know so these are all great initiatives but we don't have a real mechanism to kind of disseminate this information to down to the researcher levels or a bigger community so i would love to kind of brainstorm about that with this group if possible Thank you. Yeah, it'd be great if, other, if anyone's got ideas or if you've got that same problem in your own organization or um, ideas for how um, we might more broadly share the kinds of things we learn at conferences like this. Uh, it's all kind of uh, uh, how institutions are set up and function, I think, too, is maybe part of that. Um, I think, uh, Sun Yang, what you described, you know, uh, doing the workshops and blogs, you're really, I mean, it, it sounds like you're working really hard to uh, do what you can. And I don't know, maybe um, more high level communication between or the organizational arms or. Um, yeah, reach. it's difficult. We do work very closely with the OVCR. And um, yeah. Yeah, they're the bigger body of, you know, kind of all sorts of uh, research related topics in a way. So they're keen to governance issue, compliance issue and all this stuff. But, you know, fair data principles, open science, um, it's not always on the top of the list in a way. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I wrote a blog articles about fair data principles, for example, like a part one through four, four part blog series. So, and then also we have a monthly DMS newsletter. So I tried to incorporate this kind of information in there. But the audience we're talking about, you know, less yeah. than 100, it's not a huge <laughs> uh, audience in a way. So it, that's that's the thing. You know, we don't have a great mechanism. Um, they do have a research news, which it comes out quite often, but they don't always um, disseminate this kind of information. Oh. Oh. Um, Moriana. Hi, hello. I'm... Um... The, your question, I think, is, is, is fundamental for all librarians. Uh, we, we have the same problem here. One thing that I'm trying to do, I'm trying to uh, start um, uh, one of the open science uh, communities, the OSC or INOSC, International Network of Open Science Community, on the model from the Netherlands. Um, let me let me put the link. So I'm I'm working on starting a community, on one of those communities, and uh, it's it's a researcher community. So I will be providing just administrative support, and I hope that in, through those communities, through 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 that community, we can uh, educate the researchers more on this. Um, so, so that's that's what I'm trying. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to to create an an inosc, and I think it's it's going to be approved, almost approved. <laughs> so that's good, it. Good. So we can uh, continue to share ideas. I think in the Slack channel, uh, in and uh, how we might uh, better 
inform our own communities. Um, I, I'm going to pull this uh, session to a close because I, uh, you may have seen in your uh, agenda that we are also the closing session. So I'm going to pass the baton over to Todd and Heather, uh, who will uh, wrap up the conference. But thank you all. Uh, thank you, panelists and um, audience for a great session. Well, thank you so very much, Nettie. Yeah. And make sure I'm talking without with with the mic on. Um, so uh, this has been a fantastic conference, um, and as uh, as the head of the president of the board of force, I would like to first of all thank a variety of people before I hand it over to Cora and Heather to, to draw things to a, a close. And I promise I will be brief. The first thing I, I want to do again is to thank our sponsors. Uh, we could not have done this financially without uh, the generous support of our sponsors. So many thanks to them for all of their contributions to us as an organization and to supporting this event. Um, please look out for these organizations and support them um, as much as you can in recognition for the things that they've done for us. I would also like to extend a deepest, deepest, great, grateful thanks to all of the people who are on the Force 11 uh, Conference Committee, um, headed up very ably by Heather and Cora. Uh, but there were a lot of people behind the scenes who were contributing to this event in a variety of ways. Uh, I won't list them all out. That would take more than the five minutes we have. Uh, but each, each and every one of them uh, contributed significantly to making this event a success, and we owe them our deepest gratitude. We did record, have recorded, uh, have successfully recorded, fingers crossed, all of the sessions. And we will be working, we need to do a little bit of editing on those uh, before we uh, send them out to the community, but we will be, uh, hopefully we'll get those out to everyone in the next week. Um, I note that uh, because of the way we've set the conference up in its worldwide structure, uh, some of the some of the sessions were less pleasant uh, timing wise, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, I encourage you all to take a look at the recordings. Um, they were fantastic talks and I'm, I'm really glad that we're able to save them all and we'll be being, making them available to the community. Uh, but that is one of the challenges of serving a worldwide organization and recognizing trying to be accepting uh, of the, the people in their various spaces. Uh, it's an important element of who we are and what we're trying to do. Um, we are a team of volunteers and I wanna encourage you to sign up, engage. Uh, if you have a great idea, let's uh, you know talk about starting a working group. If you would like to engage on our website, on our communications, uh, on the conference, on Fisky, um, we can't do anything without the contributions of volunteers. Force 11 has zero paid staff, uh, full-time working for us. So it is everything you see here has been done um, by ably by volunteers. Uh, again, want to draw attention to our next big event, which is FISCI, the Scully Communications Institute. Uh, there are 14 courses in the uh, first week in August, last week in July. Um, registration is currently open. Um, I understand that we already have registrations, so you can't be the first, uh, but certainly don't be the last. Um, there are lots of opportunities for um, uh, scholarships as well, so uh, do not be put off by the registration fee. We're also planning an in-person event uh, for 2024, and we've done this in partnership with other organizations. Uh, so if you are interested in having a conversation with us, with us about hosting or co-hosting or helping us host an in-person event in 2024, uh, please go to that uh, bit.ly link 
Um, it's important that the host 2024 be all capitalized. Uh, but there's a short form to express your interest, or you can just email us at info at force11.org. One of the last conversations was how do you stay abreast of things going on in the community? I encourage you to look at the Force 11 website. Uh, we have an important uh, upstream blog that we've invested a lot of time and effort into getting going. If you'd like to contribute to that blog, uh, we can, we'd, we'd love to have you with that as well. Um, and then finally, thank you all uh, attendees for joining us. Uh, thank you so very much. And I'm going to pass it over to Cora and Heather now for a final word from, from our fearless leaders. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Cora have the absolute final word, but I just want to say thanks to everyone who contributed. As Todd said, I think that picture in 2017, I was in there somewhere, so I'm going to have to go back and hone in on that. That was my first force. Uh, folks had told me it was a very unique meeting. They weren't always able to say why. You just have to be there, and then you know. So you have been here. Now you know. Um, and uh, we hope you do get involved in the future. And over to the best uh, co-chair a person could ever need, uh, Cora. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Todd. Uh, and well, to be honest, uh, thank you to all our speakers and everything. You know, everything that Heather and Todd have already said, I can't, uh, I can't really thank enough to everybody else who supported us. Uh, it has been a real blast. I've learned. Uh, tons throughout the conference but as well as before it <laughs> uh from from all the you know um fantastic colleagues that helped to put it together um and thank you everyone for being here and you know till the next till the next forest event i think together thank you great thanks, thanks everyone